Hello everyone, I'm Ashley Sellers, speech language pathologist and owner and operator of Speech Language Radio. I'm coming to you today to talk with you about how do you know when your child is ready to receive speech therapy services. And I'm not necessarily talking about how do you know when they're eligible based on signs or symptoms of a speech therapy or speech delay that they may be showing. If you want to know more about what I'm talking about, please stay tuned. So we're talking about today, how do you know when your child is ready to receive speech therapy services? So let's just automatically assume that you've already gone through the evaluation process, your child has been authorized to receive services, and they're up to the point where they're ready to put you or your child on a schedule to receive services. The first thing that we need to consider Does your schedule allow for you to be able to commit to therapy and to show up consistently? The one thing that I have noticed in my experience as being a speech language pathologist is that parents don't think about how different speech therapy is from a doctor's appointment. When you set an appointment with your child's doctor, you may only have to do that so many times during the year. So you have enough time to look at your calendar and to carve out the time that you need to take off work to pick your child up and make sure they can make that appointment. But I don't think we think more in depth when it comes to the speech therapy. Speech therapy is more of a committed type of service that you will at least have to come to once a week, maybe twice a week, once a month or twice a month. And normally when your child is authorized to receive services, they're also committed to receive those services or authorized to receive those services from three months to six months at a time. That is a big commitment. So first you have to say with everything that I have going on as far as work or what my spouse may have going on, my child's schedule, the things they're involved in, the transportation that we have, are we committed to being able to receive services for once a week, twice a week, once a month, twice a month. And sometimes what I tell parents is, it's okay. If you have a child that comes in that may require um, a more significant amount of speech therapy, it's okay to only start to where you know you can commit. The one thing we have to consider is that just like you have the, a schedule, the therapist also has a schedule. And you want to be able to give them times that you know that you're willing to show up and be there. So that's one thing that we need to consider. The second thing that you need to consider is financial responsibility. Now, what I mean by this, of course, we know that the therapist that your child is serving, that person is not there to work for free. Some type of way they have to receive payment for the services they receive. What kind of payment are they receiving? Are you able to pay out of pocket? Is your insurance active? Are you keeping up with what it takes to keep that insurance active? Do you have a copay? Do you have a deductible amount that you will need to meet? All those things are really important. For example, if you know that you don't have insurance and you have to pay out of pocket, are you able to are you able to commit to paying the amount that that therapist charged? And if not, have you considered other therapists in the area that may be willing to work with the budget that you have? You don't always have to commit to the first person that you meet. And sometimes if that person knows that you have a financial situation that may not allow you to pay the fee they're asking, they may have a fee scale based on the amount of money that you make that you can commit to as long as you commit to paying it on time. Another thing to consider about the financial responsibility is the insurance. Do you have Medicaid plans that does not require for you to pay a copay? If that's the case, the only thing you have to do is to make sure that your child's insurance stays active so that they do not have to miss any of their therapy sessions because you're not keeping up with what it takes to keep that plan active. If you're using more of a private type of insurance, then you might want to consider, do I have a copay? Can I commit to that copay amount as often as I want my child to be able to receive services. Is there a deductible amount that I need to meet? Meaning your insurance will pay so much until you have to meet that deductible. And when you have met it or you have not met it, depending on the situation, you may end up fronting the entire cost of that bill where your insurance will only apply so much until you do the rest. When that therapist presents you with a bill, are you going to be able to pay that bill within a timely manner? That's another point to consider. A third thing that you want to be able to consider is 
therapist, are you willing to follow the guidelines and the suggestions of the therapist that your child is working with? The key thing that you want to remember is that speech therapy, even though it happens in a closed, structured clinical setting, it is up to you to decide how committed you want to be in being involved in the process, listening to the therapist, paying attention to their techniques, having a willingness to be able to take those techniques and try them at home. And also, on the flip side of that, I don't want parents to be under the impression that you always have to take everything that your therapist says to you at face value. If there is something that is going on in the session that you don't understand, ask questions. Learn how to do so respectfully because you don't want to come across as threatening to the therapist and the therapist should also be aware of their demeanor and put themselves in a position where the parents feel comfortable enough to also ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions about what you don't understand. Don't be afraid to be involved in your child's process, especially if you want to take those strategies and be able to use them at home. And how much are you willing to really listen to what the therapist says about what your child needs to do in order to make sure that the success that you want them to have, that it is evident across all environments in the clinical setting, in the home setting, in their school setting, so that what they're learning here would generalize across all environments. Another thing you should also consider, what are your expectations? Have an expectation for your child as they receive services. And sometimes those expectations can be really high. Sometimes those expectations can be really low. It is okay to discuss your expectations from the gate with the therapist, even before they even step, your child steps a foot in therapy. Discuss with them what your expectations are. They can tell you based on what they see or the level that your child is on, if those expectations are too high and what we can do to meet those expectations or if they need to be lowered, or if your expectations are too low because your child is doing much more more than what you thought they were doing. So don't be afraid to let them know what your expectations are. And then once you meet and you have that discussion, then you kind of know to know what to expect moving forward and always have a goal, even as a parent, for the amount of progress that you want your child to see in a certain period of time. I don't think there's anything wrong with a parent paying attention to how their child is responding to their therapist, how they are responding to the activities, to um, see how over time, if those strategies are carrying over at home to where it's making a difference in how they're able to communicate with you or to operate independently in their natural environment. If you don't see where that therapy is changing your child in any way or where they're making any progress or even if they're not responding well to the therapist that they're with, that's up to you as a parent to pay attention to because the reality is therapists are people, your children are people. Personalities sometimes will fit together really well, sometimes they won't. And you can't be afraid to say your therapist may be the sweetest person in the world, but maybe the way that they conduct therapy or maybe their demeanor or the structure of their therapy may not fit what's best for your child. And it's okay to pay attention to that and be able to communicate that in order for you to be able to make the right decision for your child. So that's another thing. And last but not least, how much of your child's behaving to allow the therapist to control versus how much you can control? And this is what I mean by that just based on my experience. I always want my parents to be in the session. Um, there are times when the parent being in the session is a little bit um, distracting for the child. So over time, we will establish that relationship where the parent can leave the room, the child and I can have a good therapy session. I bring them back in the end, show them everything we worked on, ask any questions. They can ask any questions that they have that I can answer and I can communicate with them what they did well on and what we needed to work harder on when they come back for the following week. But what I also mean is that when parents sit in on sessions, I limit the amount of, how can I put it, um, how much I will correct any behaviors that aren't appropriate. Because I have a really big thing about overstepping boundaries. Now, I'm not afraid as a therapist, if your child is off track, to say, okay, let's focus, let's look at this. Or if they are being easily distracted or they get up out of their seat for me to say, okay, let's finish this activity, come back to your seat. But 
most of the time, if the parent is in there, I allow for them to control the behavior because you may not know what level of discipline is appropriate for a child. And I don't feel like it's our child, our place as therapists to give any form of discipline beyond just telling your child to pay attention or to sit down or to tell them to stop doing something that could cause them to hurt themselves or that could come over as disrespectful to the therapist beyond that. I don't feel that's our job. So how much of that are you going to allow the therapist to be able to control? After a certain time for me, when kids are just really to the point where they're out of their seat or they're attempting to throw things or open up things they shouldn't, I give it to the parents to be able to go behind that child, correct them, and put them back where they need to be. And if I feel that the parent isn't controlling the situation as much, I will intervene if it has something to do with them either destroying something that I had to pay a lot of money for to be able to get if it is destroying any of my property or anything that they do can cause harm to me or someone else and I may have to intervene and say okay until we can get this behavior under control let's stop the session for the for today let's discuss some things that we probably can do better together to allow that situation not to happen again but how much of that behavior are you going to allow the therapist to be able to control versus how much you control because sometimes I think that sometimes parents can be too lax and put a lot on the therapist to also apply you know control behaviors that have a lot more to do with discipline than controlling behaviors that will lead to them having success in their therapy goals and then sometimes I feel as therapists sometimes we go too far in feeling like we need to give discipline where it may not be given and that can cross a very ethical line so those are the things that I feel like you need to consider your child is ready to receive speech therapy services I hope this video was useful if you have any questions please please feel free to leave them below and I will see you in the next video